Hello, everybody. Welcome in to the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name is Nate Gert Nibling. I'm the creator of Apples and Genos, originator of the Zero G Draft Strategy. And in this podcast, Blake and I are going to talk about the biggest hot shots and have nots of the last couple of weeks. Let's get it. And of course, I have your friend and my best friend, the fantasy redeemer, Blake Creamer, here with me tonight. How are we feeling, Blake? Fantasy redeemer. Yes, I have redeemed a few uh, people in my day, so that is very accurate. I, you know, I don't know what that means, but buddy, <laughs> we are on the home stretch here. Oh my God! Just so you know, uh, uh, folks out there, Nate and I were ready to record this episode about an hour ago, but we've just been going back and forth, watching the scores, right? um you know we got a lot of finals of uh, nate has a bunch of finals going on i have some finals going on here and i'm happy to report i'll report for myself here i'm taking the dub in the apples and genos listener league oh yeah buddy <laughs> oh th- this is this feels really good i do want to shout out the apples and genos listeners there we had a really good season lots of good people in there i was up against a guy oh what is his name i gotta find this here threat level midnight Good job, buddy. <laughs> really well done. Uh, shout out as well to, you know, no Regretsky who uh, placed third in, in the regular season while uh, with points. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just been a great season. We'll dissect all that stuff on a future pod. I love doing that, but uh, I'm feeling, I'm feeling happy, buddy. Um, how are you doing, Nate? You do have some finals. I know uh, first off everyone, Nate is, he's the most modest person I've ever seen. All right. Is that, is that fair to say, Nate, you're, you're the <laughs> most modest, more modest than any other person. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious when you say I'm by far the most modest person in the entire world. I don't Absolutely. think it's a, I don't think it's a contest. <laughs> but, no, I'm having, I'm having a good day as well. I've got one matchup in particular that's coming down to literally just like some categories here. Having a great uh, battle in the Apples and Genos Patron League. I've been like leading it in the score, but it's been literally like one shot, one hit, one block difference, like all throughout the day here today. So it's been back and forth, at least mentally, if not on the scoreboard. But uh, that one's still ongoing. I'm feeling pretty confident about my other two, but it's not sewn up yet. We still got that 10 o'clock game. What is that anyway? Like it's week 25. Don't they know? Like have everything wrapped up so that we can have this pod and actually celebrate and have a good time, right? They just don't give a damn. It's it's just very clear to me that people don't give a damn about our fantasy teams, and that's hurtful. That is hurtful. Um, also hurtful is some of the things that we have to talk about in the news and notes here, like Justin Folk and Jake Davers both out with upper body injuries. That, that was probably one of my better segues of the year, Blake. I, I saved that one just for today. Just so modest. Unbelievable. It's just so surprising <laughs> just how modest you are. I love it. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, you're going to have to pay attention to both of these guys. St. Louis does actually have a pretty solid schedule next week. So if you were considering holding on to them because they have that Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, all off night schedule next week, you're going to have to yeah, be a little a little bit uh, cautious about assigning too much uh, value to what they're going to bring you. Hopefully both are going to come back and be fine for you. Hopefully you've got a spot like IR plus or something you can stash them on. Maybe you want to think about just, uh, yep. Stashing them IR plus or IR, whatever you can in your league. And then go into like a, a Toronto Monday, Tuesday stream. And then hopefully they're back for Wednesday and, uh, yeah, they just stay on your roster, but just in the IR plus spot, that'd be an ideal scenario if you can swing that. And if they're back for Wednesday, uh, Logan Thomas appears to be fine. Thomas Thompson, Logan Thompson appears to be fine after leaving practice with an injury. Aiden Hill and Thomas Hurdle are both traveling with the team. It sounds like Hurdle could potentially play on Monday. So that's uh, interesting news. I don't really feel like I have a good grasp on what they're going to do Vegas with this, uh, with this net situation. Uh, Thompson did not have a great start there on Friday, obviously. 
Uh, wheels kind of fell off in the third period against the Coyotes. So uh, I don't know if that really affects their plans moving forward, but I do think they're going to want Hill to play some games here at the end of the season just to get him back into game shape before the playoffs hit. So I do think that probably the most likely scenario is a split uh, once again between these two guys through the last part of the season. They probably want to keep both fresh. Um, it would honestly make some sense to me if they actually alternated in playoffs. So we'll see if that actually comes to fruition. But definitely, I don't think you can rely on Thompson this week uh, the way you have been the last little while with Hill out. But I don't think that Hill coming back just means you can rely on Hill now either. I think most likely scenario is that they split and it's not a terrific situation. The good part is that Vegas does play six games in week 26. And so if they do split, you're still getting three games out of both. And that's probably okay to keep running rostering them so i'd be watching the starts closely if they do alternate the first two starts of the week here then i would take that as some kind of sign that they're most likely going to do that throughout the rest of week 26 uh petrangelo alex petrangelo also not traveling with the team so do mark that one down um yeah, not sure when he'll be back. It's a two-game road trip here, Vancouver and the Oilers, before they're back home on Friday against Minnesota. So most likely the earliest that Petrangelo could be back is Friday. Potentially beyond that, though, we don't know yet. Mikko Rantanen missing tonight's game with a concussion. Um, it sounds like they might have dodged a bullet here. Bednar mentioned this could have been worse. You do, obviously, again, need to monitor the situation here. Hopefully, and it sounds like probably he gets back into games before the season is finished, but probably, if I had to guess, the Colorado Avalanche play Tuesday and then not again until Saturday. I think it makes some sense that he misses Tuesday as well, and then they try to see if he's good to go for next Saturday. Uh, so that would be my guess, anyway, on Rantanen. And then lastly here, Timmy Stutzla out with an upper body injury, did not play today. So that's another one to monitor. Uh, obviously, they're in Ottawa. Ottawa doesn't have a great schedule. Um, so honestly, it might be a little bit of a blessing in disguise here and drop them in IR plus and maybe you can get a really solid streamer in if Stutzla is in your lineup. Anything to add there, Blake? I'm not really. I mean, I was going to talk about, you know, uh, the data point here with Rantanen out. What happens in Colorado? Looks like Lekkonen is going to be up on the top line. But, I mean, their schedule is terrible there are four games with two off nights over uh, week 26 as we said they play tuesday and then they play a saturday sunday so i mean it's not really that helpful but it is a good data point just something to look at there for sure all right let's get into it let's do some hot shots we gotta lead off with the one and only tate thompson who finally has come to life he's got seven goals 10 points in his last five games here turns out that if you play the man almost 20 minutes a night he still shoots at an elite level 18th in the league in shots per 60 the last five 40th in individual scoring chances four per 60 35th on ice Corsi four per 60 53rd on ice scoring chances four per 60 and now he's on a 35 goal 67.82 game pace um yeah honestly i think that Thompson is that dude and he can get on these stretches you know it's possible I, I haven't obviously done a deep dive into his metrics versus last year and come to any sort of conclusion about what I think is most likely a scenario for him for next year but I do think that Thompson has exhibited a lot of the attributes that I would assign to absolutely elite level um, goal scorers in the league I do think that this is a guy who has the potential to crest 100 points in the league at some point and definitely 50 goals. So I do like Tage Thompson still. It was awesome to have him come through in the clutch in the playoffs. If you picked yeah. him up in a trade somewhere or were able to buy low on him for the playoffs on one of your good teams, then obviously you're loving life. So I'd love to see that from Tage Thompson. Anything to add there, Blake? I know you grabbed him in a few spots too. I did. Yeah. I traded for Tage in a couple spots and you know, it's all worth it. If he's doing this in your playoffs, like who the hell cares who you gave up for him. Right. Uh, that's not exactly true, but you know what? We're taking <laughs> the production. We love that. But yeah, Tage's big drop off this year. Like it, it's his power play deployment. has been all over the shop. I mean, you know, he last year, he had 34 points on the power play. Just Buffalo's power play in general was really good, but he had 20 goals this year. He has 16 points on the power play. Like that, that says it all, right? Like his shooting percentage is down for sure. But I mean, it, it's, it's just been kind of a, 
like a up and down season with his deployment. And like, you know, there have been so many times where you and I are like, why, why are they doing this? Mr. Granado, can you make it make sense, please? And uh, yeah, it feels like, yeah, you give him 20 minutes a night. We're going to see Tage pop off and he has been doing that. So hopefully this is kind of just a little blip. They're trying to figure things out. Like they got some good young players there, like JG Paterka. Um, they've obviously moved Jeff Skinner down the lineup. They're, they're seeing what they have there in Benson, uh, you know, with Middlestad out, they got new guys. I don't know. But this guy needs to be prioritized. And it's going to be interesting to see where he goes in drafts next season because, yeah, which Tage are we going to get? Are we going to get um, the Tage that's, you know, their main offensive force? Or are we going to get this kind of, like, middle six Tage and, you know, potentially, like, almost power play two numbers at times? Like, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be boom or bust for Tage next season. What, what do you think? Yeah, I'm leaning towards Boom. I do think there was something to the injury and coming back from the injury, and he was playing through stuff. We saw Matthews uh, last year play through what sounded like a wrist injury, and that really hampered him. It was He was still getting to the same spots. He was still getting chances. They just weren't going in. I do think that there could have been something similar at play throughout the season at times for Tage Thompson, and it would not shock me at all if he comes back next year and absolutely blows the doors off and has a monster season. So, uh, um, like I said, haven't gotten into the numbers to formulate a kind of final opinion, and I do think that there could be some shakeups coming for Buffalo uh, this off season. So it'll be interesting to see what they do there. But uh, I think the future is still bright for a guy with this level of talent. The future is also bright for one Andre Kuzmenko. Four goals, nine points his last five games, skating 18 and a half minutes a night. Not terrific underlying numbers, 180th in shots per 60, 96th individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 179 in Corsi, 4 per 60, 112 in on ice scoring chances, 4 per 60. Uh, talk to me about your boy here, Blake. I know you love this player. I know you love the head of hair that this player brings to the rink every single day. Talk to me about Kuzi. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think after last season... I think we all knew that that was sort of sealing Kuzmenko, at least if he continues to play the way that he does, right? He's mm -hmm. he's an opportunistic player. He's an efficient player. There's no question about that. 27% efficient? No, right? That was never going to stick. We all knew that. Um, but he's at 16.3% right now. That's not too bad. And obviously the biggest knock on Kuzmenko is, is – obviously his play away from the puck. Um, it's not giving his coaches really confidence to put him out there for big minutes, but I don't know. Uh, it looks like something's clicked a little bit here. Um, and, and even if it hasn't, maybe head coach Ryan Huska is like, you know what, Kuzi, get the hell out there. Have a Pepsi. Here's a banana. Let's see what you can do. Like, you know, he's had some big minute games here. Um, a game against Winnipeg on the fourth, he played over 20 minutes. 20 minute Kuzmenko. Yes, please. I'm, I'm into that. Like this guy can do stuff. He's a very slick offensive player, right? And he's very efficient, but he's not the type of guy that can sort of drive his own offense. He's going to need like really good passing, setting him up. And, you know, he's on a 47 point pace this year, which is really low 74 point pace last year, which is high. So I think moving forward, we're probably looking at a 60 point player here, maybe 55, 60 point player for big Kuzi if he can keep that power play one and, and top six role in Calgary. But uh, it's nice to see. Uh, I just give the man some minutes. This guy's an all timer. Uh, he's a he's a beauty. Great attitude. So I, I wish him all the best. And I hope he has some success in this league. He's still he's only 28. So I think the future is bright for Kuzmenko. Uh, he, he's just going to need some prioritization he's going to need to fix some uh, play stuff of his own away from the puck yeah i think that's going to be the interesting part is can he find a coach who will like allow him to not be terrific defensively mm -hmm. um you see it with a guy like jeff skinner right like totally deprioritized at multiple points throughout his career including this last little stretch for the sabers when they've actually been playing quite well so is that the scenario for Kuzmenko where he is an asset that can get you 40 goals in a peak year, but he can also come back the next year and be totally deprioritized in lineup and you end up with a 15 goal scorer and you're just, uh, yeah, left yep. wondering what happened to your fantasy asset. So that's the concerning part with Kuzmenko, definitely a boom bust kind of profile with him for all those reasons. And also just because we don't know what Calgary is going to have here. Like he's obviously having a really good run here, but like, are we really excited about any of the guys that he's lining up next to for next year? Um, I, I can't say I am. So that's going to be, that's going to be a little bit interesting too. Like is Huberto Kadri, um, are any of these guys really making it move for 
Kuzmenko and his potential for next year. That's going to be the uh, the really big thing in my mind moving forward about what we can reasonably expect from Big Kuzi. All right, Nick Schmaltz is next up on the list. Man, you disrespected giving people advice to go Arturi Lechnin <laughs> over Nick Schmaltz. I can't be hearing I'm, these I'm glad you brought like... this up. Yeah, I will address this. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, so I have, was asked in our Discord, yeah, Nick Schmaltz today or Arturi Lechnin? And I'm like, you know what? Let's go with Lecky. All right, it's it's uh, time for Lecky. Obviously, Ranton is injured, and Lekkinen did make his way onto the top line. But I'm just seeing now he's not on power play one. Oh God! I mean, that's that that hurts a little bit, especially because Nick Schmaltz popped for a goal and assist today. But you know, shout out to my man Mike, the fantasy hockey professor, buddy. Hopefully, Lekkinen kills it for you today. Um, I'm rooting for you. Anyways, Nate, back to business. What do you got to say about Nicky Schmaltz? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to really say that that was necessarily the the wrong move. The goal was an empty netter. Like, there's there's a lot of different ways that that could have gone, but uh, had to had to give you a little bit of a rip oh, there God. for that. Nick Schmeltz, two goals, eight points his last five, 19 minutes a night. The underlying metrics never look terrific with Nick Schmaltz, but he's always been very efficient. Yeah, like 255th shots per 60, 92nd in on ice. Corsi 4 per 60 is his best number on the season now, pacing for 24 goals, 67 points. That's kind of where we feel like Nick Schmaltz usually ends up, even though he had a rough start or rough like half of the year, basically, uh, for Nick Schmaltz. And now he's come, ending up uh, like, I mean, if he continues to be hot through the rest of the season, he ends up right around that 70 point pace that we all kind of thought he might be at. So I think that Nick Schmaltz is kind of who we thought he was. I, I kind of feel like as long as Arizona doesn't have anybody taking over that spot that he's comfortably in alongside Clayton Keller at both even strength and on the power play, then I think this is kind of the guy we expect Nick Schmaltz to be moving forward. Do you got any uh, differing opinion on Schmaltzy? It's a weird one with Nick Schmaltz because of the metrics, right? It's just like it, they never look good. Um, but he's, yeah, this 70 point pace, he just keeps doing the thing, right? Um, a big factor in Nick Schmaltz's uh, success this season has been his power play performance. This guy's got career high in power play points, 21 power play points, which is excellent on this team, right? Because it's not a great power play. Uh, and 10 power play goals as well, which is really nice. Um, and so, and he's got a career high in points just in general, 60 points for Nicky Schmaltz. That's a career high, my man. So, um, it, it's just a player that is, is kind of boring and is out there. Like sometimes Schmaltz is on the waiver wire. He's still only 34% rostered in Yahoo. Like this guy has 10 points in his last six games. I mean, obviously he's, he's most likely rostered for teams that are still in the playoffs, but 34%, damn, it, it doesn't make a bit of sense. So I think, you know, I don't see anything changing moving forward next year. This guy's going to be a steadying factor for their top line. He has chemistry with Clayton Keller when he gets to play with him. And, uh, I feel comfortable projecting Schmaltz for 60 to 65 points again next season. And then if he does get really efficient and maybe ups his shot totals a little bit, we could be looking at, you know, maybe a 75 point player. Like I'm not, I don't even think that's a hot take, but I, I feel pretty secure in what Schmaltz is bringing to the table and his deployment moving forward as well. So shout out to this man and 74 uh, games. He's three games away from playing his career high, which he did with Chicago in 2017. So Band-Aid boy, no. All right. He's playing all the games. He's not injury prone. All right. He's going to play a bunch of games this year. So there you go. Yep. Um, yeah, one thing I guess I would just say about Schmaltz is I kind of think he's fitting this mold for me now of like a guy that the coach clearly does not mind putting out there for a ton of minutes every single game. And these guys end up being pretty valuable. Like Schmaltz, I'm just looking at where he got picked in my Kakuffle draft. He went in round nine there. So after pick 100. Um, but like Zegras went in front of him, Tyler Bertuzzi went in front of him because there was some hype around what he might be able to do with Matthews and Marner. That was the projected line everybody was in on. Justin Falk went in front of him. Like there were some names around there who were just a little bit more hypey, I think. Yeah. And Nick Schmaltz is just that guy who's going to be there at the end of the year and have racked up those points for you. And you need those guys in your lineup. You need the kind of unsexy plays at times. And I think that's where our next player fits in as well. Brian Russ, three goals, seven points in his last five skating almost 20 minutes a night 209th in shots per 60 139th in individual scoring chances four per 60 on the season he's been much better 83rd in shots per 60 and 39th in individual scoring chances four per 60 but like he hasn't played a full complement of games but he's on a 37 goal 73 point uh 82 game pace like 
Brian Rust is a guy that I picked in Kakupful and got him pretty late because, again, it was just one of these guys that you know he's going to produce when given the opportunity, and he does have the trust of the coach. He's one of these guys he plays in all situations, shorthanded. You know he's going to be on the ice, and that is obviously a pretty uh, key characteristic if you want a guy to be scoring you fantasy points. So what's your thoughts on Brian Rust? I know he uh, did some good things for you in a certain unnamed mini game that we will never address ever again on this podcast but uh how did brian russ week go for you blake uh, it's great i mean I, i'm i'm happy with the production obviously rust is a player that i'm i'm usually a little bit wary about like he is again like you said unsexy pick that's absolutely fine but after last season just the way he was sort of uh prioritized on the power play in 2022 like he had a 38 percent power play share after a 67 percent power play share the year previous right so that kind of got me off of rust a little bit and there are times this year like when Raquel is healthy um where they were kind of swapping those guys back and forth and rust wasn't exactly um solid on that top power play well th those days are gone like this guy is smashing right now he's getting a ton of ice time um you know ever since he missed that one game of injury like this guy's played like 19 to 22 minutes a night and that's so valuable and pittsburgh has been flying like this guy's attached to uh crosby who's just i mean he just keeps doing it sydney crosby is amazing like he, he's uh, he's he's never a player that i've liked per se but you have to respect that like he he's not just you know getting points luckily i'm talking about crosby now like he looks really good he's just such a smart player and when you have a player like that that you're, is your line mate for most of the year like rust is going to run into some points and he's good in his own right right so um yeah i think next year he could be overdrafted a little bit because of what he's been able to do here right because and we don't know what they're going to do with that power play we like we didn't know at the beginning of this season right you got Latang, you got eric carlson what were they going to do and I, I don't know. He's 31 years old. Will they prioritize Raquel? Will they get someone else in there? How about the diaper? Valtteri posting it. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he's getting some, some power play time there. So I think you enjoy it this year. And then again, next season, I'm going to be a little bit wary drafting rust. I'm going to have to see what is going on with that power play. Yep. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, we'll definitely want to track the offseason additions. But yeah, it's not necessarily this exact player, but I do want to make the overall point that sometimes you just got to look and say, what's the most likely scenario when the chips are down and they're playing for a playoff spot? Who's the coach going to be throwing out there for 20 minutes a game? And it's guys like Nick Schmaltz. It's guys like Brian Rust that can actually bring you some fantasy value this time of year. Love that. All right, J.J. Paterka, we've talked about him before, but it's worth noting again, three goals, five points, his last five skating, 20 minutes a night. So again, being a guy that the coach really trusts, and that was a big part of his game, actually. I remember him being heralded as a really good two-way prospect coming up, um, being really responsible. 20th in shots per 60, 24th individual scoring chances, four per 60, 18th Corsi, four per 60, 37th on ice scoring chances, four per 60, electric stuff from J.J. Paterka as of late on the season. He's got 28 goals, 50 points in 78 games. Got an outside shot for 30 here. If he can pot a couple more before the end of the season, uh, I'm sky high on this guy moving into next season. I think the Sabres have really found something here. Great chemistry with Tuck and Thompson on the top line and the top power play. I'd be shocked if they started next season away from that at this point. So I think I'm going to be pretty, pretty high on JJ Paterka going into next year. How about you, like? Yeah, I can't disagree with any of that. I think like this is a breakout season, no question, but I think the ceiling on this player is much higher than this, right? Like he's he's on a 53 point pace. That's great. 28 goals, 50 points in 78 games. Excellent season for JJ Paterka, right? And um he's averaging 1608 time on ice on the season, but that's because for the first like two thirds of the season, he was kind of in the middle six, right? But now he's being prioritized. And there's no way I just cannot see them putting Jeff Skinner back on that top line. So I think that's up for grabs. I think the top six is up for grabs and the top six in Buffalo is pretty damn good with these young players. But um, obviously we love the metric profile that Paterka brings. And I think this is a player that could, could really take another step next season. But again, it's going to be very dependent on deployment and access to that power play. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but I think both of those things are in the wheelhouse. We could see 70 points from Paterka next year. That would not surprise me at all. Yep. 
yeah, I think that's well within the cards here. I'll be interested. Like, I don't think this is going to be an uncommon take. Like, I think people are yep. going to be super on JJ Paterka next year. It'll be interesting to see what that does to his draft stock next year. As far as it goes for this year, like, I know there are people playing week 26 and the Buffalo Sabres do not have a great schedule for the last little bit. I think I'd still be hanging on to Paterka as long as these metrics are there, as long as he's still skating 20 minutes a night. I think he's like, I think you got to shoehorn him into your lineup. There's a lot of guys I'd be playing over. Uh, I'd be playing Paterka over in my lineups at the moment, guys with bigger brand names uh, that I would much rather have Paterka in my lineup over at the moment. So even though the schedule is not great for bus- Buffalo rest of season, I think you're rolling with Thompson and Paterka every night um and obviously guys like alex talk to on the top power play as well uh one that's pretty interesting given the schedule this week week 26 is anthony mantha we touched on briefly on the waiver wire show but i think it's worth highlighting what he's been able to do the last little bit two goals six points in his last five skating just under 15 minutes a night and so that's usually a pretty big red flag for us but uh it's hard to deny the production here 221st shots per 60 123 individual scoring chances four per 60 122 in on ice coursey four per 60 and 133 in on ice scoring chances four per 60 on the season, like this is a 27 goal, 50 point pace for Anthony Mantha. Uh, I don't think that's something we would have predicted. I mean, it's taken a 21% shooting percentage to get there, but still, the men's only played 14 minutes a night on average on the year. So, uh, what are your thoughts on Anthony Mantha? It kind of feels like they might have found something a little bit here in Vegas. Do you think that he can keep this going and he can be a valuable streamer for week 26? He'll definitely be a valuable streamer for week 26. There's no question there with Vegas off nights. Like this is a guy that should be rostered with this kind of production and what he's able to do. Uh, yeah, he should be on a, on a roster. No question, but I don't trust it at all. And now that we have Thomas hurdle coming back at some point, like what does that do? Right. There's, there's just more mouths to feed. He's going to Anthony Mantha's is going to get less touches. I, I would think. Right. And he's going to be bumped down the lineup there. Plus power play time is going to be at a premium. If he'll probably be getting that power play two time, which he already was. Not to mention, I mean, this guy, his shooting percentage is crazy, right? Like um, in the last five games, he's shooting at 25%. On the season, Mantha is shooting like pretty ridiculous uh, 21.1, all right? On the season, that's, uh, you know, over double what he shot last season with Washington, right? He shot 9.2%. So there's a lot of regression coming for Mantha, but there's only six games left right? And he's hot right now. So I think we can, you know, safely say like, yeah, you should have this guy on your team. There is a good chance he can continue this on for six games, right? Um, So, uh, you know, long story short, I I think that he's going to be very viable, very valuable for this upcoming week. But am I looking at this player moving forward as a, as a guy that I'm interested in? No, I think he's, he's streamer level at best until I see something more. And plus he's new to the team. So's hurdle. Like, we need to see what looks like in Vegas training camp here. How are they rolling these lines? What kind of deployment are they getting at the beginning of the season, right? That's going to be the true telltale sign of what kind of value we can extract from Mantha. Yep. Yeah, I do think it's worth noting that he was not on the hurdle second line. Um, that was hurdle Stevenson Amadio. So <laughs> uh, definitely looking like Mantha is not going to be up the lineup. Yeah, I would have been more interested if he had gotten some hurdle exposure. Uh, it looks like he's going to stick with the line he was on before, which is William Carlson and Pavel Dorofiev. So, yeah, unexciting, basically. Uh, long story short with what he's uh, getting in terms of usage there. But, I mean, it's a hot streak. I'm willing mm-hmm. to ride with it at the moment. Uh, the minutes are not great, but they're not, like... It's not like he's in danger of losing his spot in the lineup at the moment or something like that. So I do think uh, if you need some off nights, you could do worse than Anthony Manta. I do want to highlight just uh, three guys that kind of run together for me a little bit. All of them have six points in their last five games. All of them are between 13 and 15 and a half minutes per game in the last five games. But Danton Heinen playing with David Pasternak a whole lot here. Michael Bunting benefiting from the Penguins big run here. And then Josh Doan. Um, rookie up in the show for the first time and really popping off in his uh, opening sequence of games here so talk to me about these three maybe you can give me a quick ranking uh, just based on who you think uh, if you're doing a one game stream of each one of these guys who you'd be going for what are your thoughts on Heinen, Bunting and Doan? 
Oh God, do I have to choose the bunt cake? Oh, I probably <laughs> do. Right. So I think you got to go bunting, right? Because he's getting, he's getting time on the power play and top power play time sometimes. Right. So yeah. you got to go with bunting there and, and he's hot, right? Like, yeah, three points in his last game against Tampa. Pretty damn nice. Bunt B U N T. Well done, sir. Uh, so you got to go bunting. Then you got to go Heinen just because of his, he's playing with Pasternak, right? And Pavel Zaka, who's hot as well. So that's premium, even strength deployment. Although Heinen gets zero power play time, but I mean, that deployment is pretty sick. And then Josh Doan, I mean, this is, you, you can't bank anything on this. It's a really great story, right? I love that. I love Shane Doan. He was great for this franchise. And then for this guy to come in and just start popping off pretty damn nice. I mean, low sample size the metrics look pretty damn good like what the hell i mean you know it it we don't know anything this sample size is too small and the team is terrible so they have full on they 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 can just throw guys out there and be like yeah go ahead man just see what you can do right that's sort of what the coyotes are doing right now sending this guy out but it has been nice it's just not a player we don't know anything about this player will he even be with the team next season i don't know but uh, dynasty, I mean Josh Doan, that's a that's a nice piece. I, I think I'd be looking to get get a piece of Josh Doan and see what's what. But yeah, the bunt cake. Oh God, beautiful head of hair, little curly little hair there. I love it. Uh, I don't know. Shout out to Michael Bunting. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a fair assessment in terms of the talent of the players. I will say, like Denton Heinen plays Tuesday and then not again till Saturday, so that's a rough schedule to be holding the player if you are looking at one of these guys versus you got Bunting who plays on the Monday off night here, then plays Thursday, Saturday on heavier nights. Doan has the better schedule of the three for sure. He plays Tuesday heavy nights, but then uh, Tuesday on the heavy night, but then Wednesday, Friday, Sunday off nights. So that's obviously the best schedule, but he's playing down the lineup. He's playing with McBain and Michelli down the lineup and not even on either power play unit at the moment. So it's really tough to hang on to any sort of hope that he's going to keep this hot streak going unless that deployment changes, which it could. Uh, but don't more of a back end of the week stream if he gets an, a deployment improvement in my mind bunting the guy that you feel probably the best about kind of hanging on to his current role and being kind of reliable in that sense uh, but i don't mind what heinen's been able to do either you know if you're looking ahead to the end of week 26 so not this upcoming week but the uh, following part of that he does have a monday tuesday back to back in uh, what's that the 15th and 16th of april so that's where i'd be the most interested in rostering a guy like danton heinen all right. I did want to talk about Chris Letang and Zach Wierenski because I love both players and both yeah. of them have been popping off, but I will table that in the interest of time here because we have another review that came in and I do want to read that out here on the podcast. This, po this review says, let's get to biz from Skin Squad. Hands down the best fantasy hockey pod out there. Nate Blake and Josh are amazing hosts bringing in bringing in-depth analysis, helping win fantasy hockey titles. With the hilarious banter thrown in, you absolutely can't beat it. These guys are beauties, and I can assure you they will help you win your leagues. Trust me, give it a listen. That is a terrific review. Thank you very much for that, my good friend. All right. Um, yeah, basically all I'm going to say at this point, you know, I usually talk about the Patreon and talk about stuff going on. I do want to let people know uh, over the summer, the Patreon, I've already released it. It's going down to, uh, I think it's like two bucks a month uh, is the lowest you can put <laughs> a monthly subscription on Patreon. So that's what it's at. Um, two bucks a month gets you into the Patreon all summer long. You'll get uh, advanced looks at my projections when I start building those out, usually sometime after free agency has come and gone and we've got a good idea of what the teams are shaping up to be like so get in the discord for that i also yeah over the summer i try to put in some some goodies for the patron members so that's what you can do in terms of patreon over the summer and yeah there's definitely more on the way blake and i've been talking already about some ideas that we've had we did the listener survey and we got some really good responses on that so i'm really excited about implementing some of that stuff and creating an even better product for everybody next year so patron members will absolutely get first look at all of that this off season all right blake are you ready for some have nots you bet your sweet bippy buddy and just so you know everybody that two dollars a month goes directly 
to fund Nate's pixie stick addiction. All right. And ah. uh, you know what? He need he does need some help. We haven't talked about the pixie sticks, but Nate's been abstaining. Uh, but you know, he's back on the train. And you know what? It, it's fine, right? He can stop anytime he wants to. He just doesn't want to. <laughs> That's uh, completely accurate. No, no notes. All right. Let's talk about some of these have nots. Uh, I got a couple guys here that I kind of view similarly at the moment. Marco Rossi and Shane Pinto. Rossi's got just one goal. I think that goal came today, if I remember correctly, from checking a box score earlier today. Um, Rossi, one goal his last five, skating just under 18 minutes a night. Pinto, similar, zero points his last five, 17 and a half minutes a night both in the 240s for shots per 60. Pinto's got better on-ice numbers, 71st, Corsi 4 per 60, 96th on-ice scoring chances, 4 per 60, versus Rossi, who's down at 226 for Corsi 4 and 282 for scoring chances for. Um, who would you take between the two, I guess, at the moment, Blake? Can you break that down for me a little bit? I think kind of similar players uh, in terms of their streamability at the moment. Rossi or the Pinto Bane? Um, like this season or next season? Right now, week 26. Right now? Ooh. Um, week 26, I think I got to oh, – I don't have the schedule up. Oh, Nate, what are you doing to me, buddy? You so just Minnesota's... throw up the end of the – <laughs> yeah, give me yeah, give me that. That would be helpful. All right. So this week, uh, the week upcoming, Ottawa plays on all the heavy nights, three games, no off nights. Uh, and then Minnesota goes three games, but they do have one off night on the Friday. And then the second half of the uh, of the week there, you got Minnesota playing two games, and Ottawa also plays two games. So no difference really in the second week. So very similar schedules. Uh, one extra off night for Minnesota. Okay. Um, yeah, I, both players are, are pretty underwhelming. I feel a little more confident in Shane Pinto for some reason. I feel like there's been times during the season where he's shown out in the metrics that we really like. Obviously, it hasn't been lately. Like this guy in the last five games, 248th in shots and goal for 60, buddy. Come on. No, you got to shoot the puck. Um, so, but both of them are kind of in the same boat, right? And they both have good deployment. That's the thing too. Like um, Rossi it, right now is playing between the Zucchini man and uh, Kaprasov, which is pretty damn nice. He's also on power play too. That's fine. Whereas Pinto's playing pretty much the same deployment. He's on the top line with Batherson and Brady Kachuk and then power play too. Um, I feel like Pinto has a better pathway to points and production. So I'd probably go Pinto there. I don't know though. Both these players next season, I would say even into next season, I'd probably be more into Shane Pinto. I just, I'm not sure what type of player Marco Rossi is. Like this guy has had stretches this year where he's getting 20 minutes time on ice, full top line, top power play. And he hasn't really been able to, to pop with that. You know, like a, he's got 21 goals and 17 assists uh, for 38 points in 77 games. That's, that's nice. I mean, a 21 goal season in the NHL, nicely done, right? He's only 22. He's, his trajectory should be on the rise, right? But I don't know. He, he had an opportunity to do some stuff and it, didn't really pan out the way that I would like to see it. Whereas Pinto, I feel like Ottawa is just a, a much worse team than Minnesota, um, despite what Pinto has been able to do. Like, I think he's been really good. And I think there's going to be some changes in Ottawa moving forward. And Pinto could be prioritized a little bit. So I think I have a little bit more confidence in Pinto next season and Pinto this season. Not to mention they have, well, well I guess they have one less off night. So I don't know if that matters. Go Rossi. But in a bubble, I'm taking the Pinto bean. Yeah, I think overall I agree with the take. The to Chuck Batherson Pinto line has been left alone. It was a good line again for them in their last game here against Washington. They had a 75% Corsi 4 nice. um, uh, ratio there. So again, it was an effective line, even though they didn't net anything out of it. I think it's just kind of a cold stretch where he was hot before. Yep. Now he's gone cold. I don't think I want to, you know, uh, draw too much into that or read too much into that. So I do think I would take Pinto over Rossi just basically on the virtue of the fact that he's playing with better players at even strength. Neither are getting prioritized on top power play. So that's uh, just a draw there. All right, Matt Duchesne, we got to talk about. He's got zero points in his last five games, 16 minutes, average time on ice. That's been fairly consistent throughout the entire year. They are playing at the moment against Colorado. Um, so 
you know, by the time this hits your ear holes, you might have heard something different about Matt Duchesne. Maybe he pops off in the second part of this game here, and he really uh, makes us look stupid with all of our takes here. That's a possibility. But 210th in shots per 60, 183rd individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 144 on ice. Corsi, 4 per 60, 116 on ice. Scoring chances, 4 per 60. Give me some thoughts on Matt Duchesne. If you look ahead for week 26 here, Dallas does not have a good schedule. They got the three games, zero off nights for this week upcoming. Uh, and then they only give you one more game in the second part of week 26. So it's not a great schedule for Dallas. Are you thinking about dropping Duchesne if you're playing week 26? I never had him. All right. <laughs> I bounced him a long time ago and he's been making me look like a dingus all year. But not anymore. All right. The prophecy has been fulfilled. This man was a sell high, folks. Duchesne was a sell high. All right. Hopefully you were able to get off this man and get some value because, yeah, I mean, uh, I, you know, I'm talking Yang on Duchesne. It's been a great season. The guy's got 62 points in 76 games. There was a time where he was playing with Sagan and I think it's Mason Marchman, and they were probably the best second line in the league. They were popping off. Everybody was going nuts. Um, but nothing of uh, that was never sustainable. I mean, it's a guy like you, like you said, he doesn't shoot. He doesn't get a lot of chances and he was just going off high efficiency. So what happens when that, the puck stopped going in, right? Now you got a guy who doesn't shoot. He doesn't get chances and now he's not scoring as much. And that's what's happening with Duchesne right now. I mean, he's right in line with his season last year, um, which, which is actually a, a success story for Matt Duchesne because he's also playing almost two minutes less per night. Yep. So great season for Matt Duchesne, amazing hockey trade for the Dallas stars. Like he, the Dallas is, they're so stacked. Their top nine is ridiculous. And Duchesne's a big part of that. So it, the fact that he's got zero points in his last five games, who cares? Like you got other guys popping off, right? Wyatt Johnson, Rupa Hintz is doing stuff now. Um, you know, Heiskin and this, they, they got so many good players on that team that it doesn't really matter. This He's a supplementary piece, but yeah, I, I think you could drop him. Absolutely. Four games with one off night, um, you know, and you got guys like Kuzmenko out there. Give me Kuzmenko over Matt Duchesne every day of the week. It's happening. So I don't know. What are you doing with Matt Duchesne? Yeah, I think it's a fair take at this point. Um, I don't think you have to feel beholden to Matt Duchesne just because he's had a good year to this point. Um, he can easily be prioritized away from Dallas can prioritize any one of their top three lines really at any given time based on who's hot. And Duchesne clearly is not. So I don't think that's a bad take whatsoever. Another team that does a little bit of that is the LA Kings. And we got to talk about Quentin Byfield because he has gone ice cold the last little bit. Yep. Zero points his last five games, 16 minutes, average time on ice. 166th in shots per 60, 245 individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 254 on ice Corsi, 4 per 60, 167 on ice scoring chances, 4 per 60. That's uh, 19 goals and 53 points in 75 games so far for Quinton Byfield. It's been a good season for sure, a breakout season for him. Um, but, I mean, again, like last night, he's playing on a line with Adrian Kempe, who pops off for two goals and an assist, and, and Byfield manages to find himself none of that. Uh, he's been deprioritized in terms of the power play. Victor Arvidsson has gotten on that top power play over him as of late. So what are you doing with Quentin Byfield for week 26? And what do you think about Byfield's prospects into next year? I'm excited about Byfield. Like we, we talked about Paterka already and, you know, they have different um, like fantasy stat, like uh, profiles, you know what I mean? Like Byfield is not a metrics guy, whereas Paterka is. But I mean, I his trajectory is clearly on the rise. This is a very dynamic player. He does he he just is a different player than Paterka, but I think on the same trajectory. I could see Byfield getting 60 to 65 points next season, kind of just taking another step in his development, right? But obviously, we're gonna need to see uh like some consistency in the deployment, right? And when he has been really going, he's been top line, top power play. And we've seen what this guy's capable of doing. And he's only 21. Like I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for Byfield. You got me on this guy, like, you know, a quarter into the year and I've, I've just been watching him ever since and, and really liking what I'm seeing. It's probably just ran out of gas a little bit. This is a young player, yeah. right? And you know, the Kings are, have kind of played themselves into a spot where they're, they have to, you know, put out their horses, like their best players, because they got to win games and, and rack up some points here to get, you know, some playoff seating and stuff like that. So I, I can understand why Byfield's getting deprioritized a little bit. But, um, you know, 
Next season, I think it's just going to be another step. Probably throw another 10 points onto his production, and we'll see what's what. But uh, it's been a great season. That said, I mean, you could drop by field, no question, if you can find a streamer where you're adding games, like a similar type player. Right? There's lots of guys like that out there. Big koozie. All right. We're down, I'll, I'll, give me big koozie over Quentin Byfield this week. No question. Yeah, I think that's a fair take as well. I mean, LA again, one of these teams, three games, zero off nights this week. Two of those are against Anaheim, so that's a little bit more enticing. The other one's against Calgary, which is obviously not a terrifying team by any stretch of the imagination. Then they do come back with two games in the second part of week 26, so five total games here. That's not a bad spot to be either, so I don't think you have to move off of Byfield, but if he's going to be on the bench for you at all this week, then I wouldn't think twice about it. Um, yeah, like you said, I think there is a real player here. I think we've seen some pretty good glimpses of it at times throughout the season, and I do think that next year is probably another step for him along the way. Do question, you know, with LA, the way that they split the time up, does he ever really get to that like point per game plus where he's a true difference maker? I'm not sure that that ceiling exists in the current iteration of the Kings, um, but we'll see. Um, I think that the story is still yet to be written on Byfield. I don't think that what he what we saw from him this season is like his final form yet. This is still a maturing hockey player. Uh, he's got a lot more growing to do in terms of his on ice product. All right, we do need to talk about Joel Erickson Eck, who has just one assist in his last five games, 21 minutes a night, still doing that. 56 shots per 60, 36 individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, still doing that. 83rd on ice Corsi, 4 per 60, and 59th on ice scoring chances, 4 per 60. Now he's on a 34 goal, 71 point, 82 game pace. You have your thoughts really changed at all on Joel Erickson Eck? I mean, Minnesota's got that Tuesday, then Friday, Saturday schedule uh, in the next week, the early part of week 26. Are you really thinking about doing anything other than you've always done with Joel Erickson Eck? No. I don't think so. I mean, it, you know, maybe as the week goes on, like if there's more donuts and and you have an option to, you know, get some games played in there. Yeah, maybe that's fine. But this guy's been a boon this year. It's been amazing. Um, you know, I, I don't know that we can expect this every year from Erickson Eck. Like, you know, he's on a 71 point pace. This, I don't think there's much more room for him to go there. Like maybe 75, but look at these perifs too. 161 hits. That's amazing. 54 blocks for a forward. That's excellent. This guy's a horse. He's out there 20 minutes and 38 seconds. I don't think that's going to change uh, moving forward like into next year. I think this is a core guy for the wild and i'm excited about it this is still a guy who's probably going to be underrated next year he's just a he's he's kind of a no thought to me but like he he gets power play one time which is really keeps his floor up he's got another 20 power play points this season he'll probably match his career high which is 23 last season um i'm, I'm a big fan of the player i love the metrics like his efficiency you know if, if he could ever find that you know put the biscuit in the basket at a, at a reasonable rate we could see maybe a 40 goal uh, Joe Erickson Eck, but I, I just don't see that coming. I think this is sort of the player he is and I'm loving it. This is a great guy for fantasy. Another guy you can probably get after pick 100 and, and you're loving life. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add on Joel Erickson Eck. Definitely a lot of what he's been able to do has been volume based to this point. Mm -hmm. And so if there ever does come a point in which Marco Rossi, you know, takes another step and becomes that, you know, scoring threat and the center for Kaprizov on the top line, mm -hmm. then that would obviously be a hit to Joel Erickson Eck. And maybe he becomes more of the shutdown guy, uh, gets all the primo matchups and they try to move um, some things around that way. I don't know how much I buy that narrative uh, necessarily, but it's definitely something that you would think about. Uh, Erickson Eck, a little bit more of an accumulator than a true, like, um, a top end talent in yeah. my mind. So we'll keep that in mind for next year, but uh, definitely a terrific year for Joel Erickson Eck. Don't want to take that away from him whatsoever. Uh, Brock Nelson has had a terrific year, but not a terrific stretch as of late. Just one goal in his last five. Still skating over 17 minutes a night. 129th in shots per 60, 210 in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 219 in Corsi, 4 per 60, and 214 in on ice scoring chances, 4 per 60. Uh, what happened with Brock Nelson here, Blake? Just as you were getting on board, he pulls the rug out from under you. Are you uh, back to hating the man? 
It's Patrick Waugh, all right? He's, he can't coach them properly. He's got his two Stanley Cup rings plugging his ears, all right? <laughs> um, no, but I think there there has been a major shift in this team, and I think they're still trying to figure it out under the new coach there. And I think that's affected Nelson, and it's affected Dobson. You know, like um, players that were popping off under the previous regime, yeah, it's it's been a bit of a struggle here moving forward, and the pressure might be getting to them, right? They're sort of, yeah, they played themselves out of a playoff spot, basically. Now they're, they're fighting to get in there. Are they in currently now that I'm saying that? Uh, oh, yeah. So they're in. Yeah, they're, they're, they're in right now. But, I mean, it's it's tenuous, right? They, they're two yeah, points up on the, on the wild card spot. So they got to put some some games together here. But, yeah, long story short, I, I, I am a Brock Nelson fan at this point. When you when you get metrics like this um, and, you're, and you're on a team that gets no fanfare and it, it's just – it's like – uh, right for the picking. You know what I mean? A guy like Brock Nelson, you, you don't go into your drafts and be like, I got to get my guy, Brock Nelson. No, you're like, Brock Nelson's still here? What the hell is this? This makes no sense. I'm drafting him immediately. Um, so I, I think we know what kind of player Brock Nelson is. Yeah, this is a cold stretch. I would imagine he finishes the season out. He's on a 65-point pace. I would imagine that's sort of where he finishes, which is a, a pretty great season, right? And I think it's almost an underachieving season for Brock Nelson. So I think what we'll see is, you know, a little bit more headroom, probably a 70 point pace next season, if he can get that efficiency back up. And he has had that previously. So yeah, you like the player top line, top power play. Give me some grumpiest man on earth. I mean, some of his new pictures, he does have a little bit of a smirk. So I think things are turning for Brock Nelson. He's, he's lightening up a little bit. Uh, you know, I don't know. He got a puppy or something like that. So I think uh, the things are good in Brock Nelson's world. Yeah, overall, I'm not really that concerned about Brock Nelson, the player, by any stretch. But, I mean, I'm not thrilled about the fact that uh, he did get bumped off the top power play. They tried some really weird stuff here. So they kind of split it somewhat evenly. But, I mean, it was a Palmieri lead Nelson unit with Mike Riley and Ryan Pulak on the back end. And then they had Casey Zizekas, John gabriel Pajot with Horvat and Barzell. Like, they tried some really weird stuff on the power play. I don't know how much uh, that could possibly last, how long that could possibly last, but uh, it's not a great look that they're thinking about trying things like that. As far as the rest of the season goes, Islanders don't have a great schedule. They're not going to help you out a whole lot. Um, they do play two games in the second half of week 26 here, but um, that's about as good as it gets. So that part is a little bit concerning. Uh, overall, I'm not uh, I'm not concerned about the player. I'm more concerned about the cold streak affecting his deployment, basically. Uh, lastly here, I want to touch on a couple of defensemen. Brandon Montour getting on the have-nots yeah. list again, and Brent Burns as well. Both just one point in their last five. Montour skating 24 minutes a night. Brent Burns 20 and a half. Both have great underlying metrics. On-ice metrics look terrific. Um, Brandon Montour 64th in shots per 60, but 14th in individual scoring chances for per 60. Brent Burns has kind of the flipped situation, 19th in shots per 60, but 143rd in individual scoring chances for per 60. Basically just taking more shots from range is what you can read into that number. Both now pacing for 42 points on an 82 game schedule. So both in a similar uh, spot in terms of their production on the season. Uh, neither of these guys have great schedules. They both only have four games left on the year. Are you thinking about dropping either of these guys? Uh, how how uh, shallow would the league have to be for you to drop one of these guys for this year? Uh, I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I'd, I'd drop anybody. And these guys to me are not like, I don't, I wouldn't consider them bubble players. Right. Not at all. Like they're both um, power play one for their respective teams. But yeah, Brandon Montour, man, he is he is. This has been a frustrating year. I think I'm, I'm definitely going to be putting a lot more stock into and I should have thought of this last year. I don't know why this wasn't a narrative that I was thinking about. But guys that get injured like Matt Kachuk and Brandon Montour are prime examples of guys that had insanely slow starts because they were coming off massive injuries where they they couldn't quite, you know, get into the rhythm. They were, they had to hit the ground running and it, and it didn't exactly work. And um, with Brandon Montour, he's like, yeah, he's 29 years old right now. Is he the number one? Like, is he quarterback in that power play again next year? Like we still have Aaron Ekblad there, Gustav Forsling. I mean, they're not guys that they would throw on there necessarily, but I don't know. Is his role safe? I'm, I'm very interested in what happens with Brandon Montour next season. I think he's going to 
you know, plummet down drafts. So this guy's going to be value next year, but I'm not a hundred percent that he's going to come back to like, you know, 65, 70 point Brandon Montour, even with the metrics, right? Like I, I just, I'm not, I'm a little bit wary of his role there and it's been a rough season. So uh, that said, I mean, yeah, I dropped Montour if I could get like a significant uh, advantage in games played and it always depends on the ad. Right. But I think he's power play one on an amazing team. You've got to hold that player. You have to hold him like, and he's shown to like, he, yeah, he's got zero points in his last three games, but he can just as easily pop off for two goals or two assists and all power play stuff. So, um, yeah, probably holding on to her Brent, Brent Burns. I'd feel a little bit more comfortable dropping. Um, cause his ice time is lower as well. Um, like Montour in the last five games, 24 minutes, average time on ice where Burns is averaging like 20, 20 and a half. Right. So it's a, it's a little thing, but I think I'd stick with Montour there. But I mean, if you don't have to get off Burns, don't, right. He's got double digit goals on the season, 10 goals. Carolina looks good. So ah, I don't know. It's they're They are very similar players though. And I can see why you put them together. Yeah, so just, I guess, as a point of context, would you take an extra game of Thomas Shabbat over either of these two? No. Yeah, I don't think there's many guys. I, I started to try to put together a list yeah. of guys that I could do the <laughs> yeah. uh, comparison with. Okay, let's go uh, Brock Faber. Brock Faber, uh, I think they've got five games. Am I right about that? I'll double check that. But yep. Brock Faber or... Uh, would you take four games of these two guys? Five games of Brock Faber versus four games of these guys? No, Montour and Burns. Not taking yeah. Faber there. Yeah, I don't think realistically the guys are going to yeah. be out, out there. there. Yeah. yeah, I don't think there's anybody out there that realistically is going to be improvement over these guys for your fantasy teams. All right, well, that's going to be it for the have-nots. If we didn't talk about a player that you do want to hear about, make sure you join me for Monday's 8 p.m. EST live stream where I'll be talking about puzzling players. I'll be putting out a call in the Apples and Geos Discord server for all your puzzling players. Uh, can be, you know, can be just puzzling players on the year. Can be guys that you want me to talk about on the year and didn't go the way that you thought it would. Can be players for week 26 that you're worried about uh, one way or the other. Is it sustainable? They're producing too well, or are they going to bounce back and be good for me in the playoffs? Uh, but definitely join Mondays, 8 p.m. EST. This will be the last puzzling players of the year, so it's definitely an event you don't want to miss. All right, Blake, let's go under the hood. Let's talk about Connor Garland. I know you've been talking about this guy, and so I thought you'd be happy to see me pick oh, him yeah. up for this segment here. Last 10 games, three goals, five assists, eight points. And even more recently than that, he's been getting elevated up the lineup, and the results have been even better. 16-13 average time on ice in this span, 18th in the league in shots per 60, 26th individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 21st in Corsi, 4 per 60, 48th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. Um, basically, uh, I'll get your take first, Blake. Talk to me about Connor Garland. What do you think about this guy for the rest of the season here for week 26? Give me a take on what you think you can get out of a guy like Connor Garland for the rest of the season. Vancouver does actually have a pretty solid schedule here. They've got five games to play here. So obviously he's getting you some value in that regard, but, uh, rest of the season, do we think Connor Garland is a fixture in the top six? How how much of a fixture on the top power play is he at this point? Um, do we think he's going to get most of that top power play time rest of season? And then just an overall take on the player in terms of what we can expect moving forward. Hmm. Um, well, I'm excited about Connor Garland. It's the thing that's that always holds Connor Garland down to me and will probably continue to hold him down is his ice time, right? Like, yeah, he has had a couple games here of 18 minutes. Uh, or 19 minutes almost in the game against Arizona. So that's excellent, but I just don't trust it, right? Like this, this is a true like second to third liner. That's really the role that Connor Garland excels at. So yes, he can be moved up the lineup for short periods of time, but I don't see that being sustainable, right? I, I think uh, once he starts getting the other team's top, you know, defense and pair, like it's going to start having an effect on Connor Garland. I just don't think like he's a small guy too. Right. So um, I think there's some durability issues. I don't know. I'm talking some Yang on Garland. This guy's been playing amazing. And <laughs> I do think that power play one is something that might happen here for the next five games. I think that's like the only person I can see knocking him off potentially is if Elias Lindholm comes back. 
right? And that's, I still think that I would lean Garland there. Like, I don't think they're just going to throw Gar uh, Lindholm right on the top power play. Like, they're probably easing back in, but um, things are working. They're looking good. And just the eye test, too, with Garland. This guy is amazing at puck retrieval. In the corners, like, he's so slick. Like, he's doing stuff off the back of the net. He's he's winning battles in the corner. This guy weighs 165 pounds, and he's 5'9" you know, and he's, he's, you know, beefing guys out of the puck and, and making amazing passes to the slot. So, um, I'm a fan of the player. I'm a fan of his deployment right now. Like what, what is his line? He's playing with JT Miller and Dakota Joshua, which has been excellent. He has great, great chemistry with Joshua. I could talk about this guy all day. I'm going to, you know, shut my mouth, but the fact that he has access to JT Miller now at even strength, they have some chemistry as well. So I think he's absolutely viable five games and four nights for Vancouver. I, I think he's absolutely worth an ad and can definitely help your team. Yeah, I definitely think Garland is worth rostering at least as long as he's on the top power play and probably as long as he's holding down a top six role there. I think that Garland uh, kind of falls into this category for me. Like I talked about this with Alex Nylander in this segment before where, you know, I'm seeing some proof of something. So it's a player that I'm going to feel legitimately excited about when the deployment is there. I'm not confident that the deployment is always going to be there for Alex Nylander. I'm not confident that the deployment is always going to be there for Connor Garland. Yeah. but when it is uh, that's going to be a priority for me moving forward and that's what I think we can really take away from these kind of stretches of play where we see the proof of concept with these guys where when they are put in the position to succeed they can elevate their play alongside good players and end up putting some points on the board for us in fantasy all right Blake take us into the, the move of the week you bet. Um, nothing too much to say here. Like all the moves I made for my my head to head leagues were done last week. Like I had buys, so my teams were ready to go. Um, one move I did make that I was really happy with is I streamed in that drywall destroyer, that monster energy drink chugger, Kyle Paul Mary. This guy had a great week, and yeah, I just I just want to shout the man out. I mean, it's nothing groundbreaking, but um, he was like again. Something that everybody needs to do is you sit, you start all your active players, you look at where the gaps are, and you have to plug players in that can get games. And Kyle Palmieri, I actually got all four games from the Islanders out of Kyle Palmieri, and he popped off. So he really helped me out. I did lose that matchup, but it wasn't because of Kyle Palmieri. It's because my opponent uh, was just yoked out of his mind with steroids. I don't know, but uh, yeah, he, he smashed me really good. But anyways, um, I like that. I also did pick up Dylan Genther in a, in a spot too. So I'm just shouting out my streamers because that's those are those are guys that actually did stuff. And then I felt good about that. But, you know, Vincent Trocek, I ain't mad at you, buddy, but he did nothing for me this week. Buddy, it, it, you're off the hook, buddy. It's all right. He's a friend of the show, Vinny Tro. You know this. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, for myself... It's really just been this one matchup that's been the biggest question mark for me all week in the patron league and obviously categories leagues. You have a little bit of interesting strategy about, you know, which categories you want to target uh, with your final ad of the week. So I had one ad left on Sunday here today. Uh, basically, it's, it's a very tight matchup across a bunch of categories. Um, assist was tied. Uh, shots on goal within two hits, very close blocks, very close. Uh, he has one more win than I do. I was ahead in saves, but he had, uh, Primo and Shesterkin going head to head against each other today. And then I had Yorgiev going. And so the decision that I made was because he had Primo and Shesterkin playing each other, I know he's going to pick up a win, but he can only pick up one win. And so if I can take a W with, uh, with both Georgiev and a goaltender pickup, then I could potentially tie wins. But I can also, I also find that if you have saves as a category, it's a pretty reliable thing uh, to be able to stream a goaltender and just assume that they're going to get you, you know, at least 20 saves or at least 25 saves. That's pretty regularly the case. And so I felt like, yeah. Uh, I had the Connor Ingram start available to me against San Jose coming off a back-to-back. -back. Uh, San Jose played into overtime the night before. I had a great game, emotional game, and so it felt like a letdown game for a lot of reasons and obviously not a great team in San Jose. 
So felt like I had a really good opportunity to pick up Ingram there. Uh, went well, obviously got that there. Looks like my plan is going to come to fruition here. And as long as Georgiev doesn't get himself pulled, which has been a problem as of late, I should uh, pull saves back here. And that should end up being the difference in the matchup, theoretically. Uh, we'll see how it plays out, obviously. But that's a, that's a good spot to be. And I think you just got to think about these things. And yeah, take a look at your opponent's goaltenders. Sometimes they're playing each other and you know that they can't get more than one win and so you know that you've got a pretty good shot to actually um yeah take back that uh, that category as well so a few different things going on there but uh i think it's just an interesting thing to think through and one of the things you really do have to take some time and evaluate in a categories league all right, unfortunately, we do have one more piece of business to take care of. We have to recap the head to head streamer death match. And Gustav Nyquist didn't have a terrible week, but it was only 12.25, a couple points in the end with his three assists versus Brian Rust absolutely popping the hell off for 25, a couple points. So Blake now up by, by some score on the season. I don't want to read out what it is, but it starts with a 14, and I had 10, so you can figure that out. This week, I have Thomas Hurdle. And he's got big koozie, so we'll see how that goes uh, for the week 26. Uh, you got anything to say about this, Blake? I'm just uh, totally angry at myself. I'm angry and disappointed. All of my potential fantasy <laughs> fantasy championships here mean nothing to me. You've defeated me, and I just can't say anything more on the subject anymore. Yeah, you know what? I mean, this this could be the true test, right? I mean, if we're being <laughs> real, I think that's probably right. But I think we're going to have to change the name. Uh, it can't be Deathmatch anymore, Nate, because we want to keep you around, all right? Uh, I did yeah. win this time, but I, I don't think I can kill you. So I, I think, you know, <laughs> we're, we'll have to change it to something, I don't know, like Super Friends or something forever. That, that makes a little <laughs> bit more sense. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to do it. That was a fun little mini game we had throughout the year. I want to do that again next season for sure. And uh, before I quit here, I just want to uh, shout out to our listeners as well if you guys i would nate and i would love to hear about what you were able to do in your fantasy league so if you won please message us like dm me on twitter dm me on the discord put it in the discord dm nate like uh we want to hear about your victories because your victories equal our victories all right we are stoked for you guys so i'd love to hear that yeah i would echo that i actually just got one uh got yeah, one me of too. dms that's what made me think yeah yeah, well, we're uh, recording here, so that's pretty awesome. Love to see that. Uh, I've got all the time in the world for people messaging me about how uh, anything we've done this year has helped you on your way to a fantasy championship. So by all means, reach out. All right, that's going to be all that we've got for this episode. Hopefully it brought you some value, helped you get a little bit better at fantasy hockey today. Many thanks to the band there there for supplying the music for the podcast. Be sure to check out their Spotify as well. That's it, folks. Much love. Thank you.